Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 2, which you can find and follow along with today on page 242 of your pew Bibles. Just like last week, we're going to read the entire chapter. There are four chapters in the book of Ruth, so if you're here every Sunday during the sermon series, you will have read through an entire book of the Bible by the time you're done. But since those chapters are a little bit longer than our typical scripture readings, I'm going to intersperse the reading with the sermon itself. So as we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. An older couple one day is sitting on their couch, and the man says to his wife, if I die, do you think that you'll get married again? The wife thinks about it for a while and replies, well, I don't want to be lonely, so probably yes. The husband furrows his brow at this and says, well, are you and him going to live in our house? The wife replies, well, it's already paid off, so yeah, probably so. By now, the husband is quite concerned. He lays down his newspaper, and then he says to her, are you going to let him use my golf clubs? And the wife replies, of course not, honey. He's left-handed. Last week, last week we heard the story of two widows, Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. Having both lost their husbands in the land of Moab, Naomi decides to come back to her people, to her home country of Judah in the land of Israel, and Ruth decides to come with her, famously and perhaps a bit stubbornly telling her mother-in-law that where you go, I will go where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. So in today's scripture passage, Ruth and Naomi have arrived in Judah. But they arrive with no resources, no money, no food, no protection, no connections, no family, immediate family beyond simply each other. So this is not exactly a hopeful situation at the beginning of chapter 2. Let's read together, starting with verse 1. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now we're going to set this aside for just a moment, because you may be thinking, oh, great news! But Naomi and Ruth are not aware of this kinsman yet. This is just a sneak preview that Naomi's husband, who passed away, had a relative back home, and his name is Boaz. File that for future reference. We'll get there, but for now, it's still pretty bleak. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I might find favor. So Naomi said to her, go, my daughter. I love that she calls her daughter here, not my daughter-in-law. At this point, they have transcended the marriage relationship, and they are actual family together. So go, my daughter. So Ruth went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered like good Presbyterians, and also with you. <laughs> Actually, they said, the Lord bless you too. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came, and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. 
Now, according to the ancient law codes of Israel, gleaning or picking up the leftover grain behind the workers in the fields is a legal right for certain groups of people. The book of Deuteronomy in chapter 24 spells this out clearly. It says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. That same law is repeated a little bit later in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. It says this, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. Now, Ruth seems to meet every single one of these categories. She is an alien or a foreigner. She is a widow. She is poor. And as we learned last week, she is probably an orphan too. So if anybody qualifies for this type of assistance, following behind the workers and picking up the excess grain, it should be Ruth, right? Well. Ruth is not just any foreigner. Also, as we learned last week, she comes from Moab, the land of Israel's most bitter and hated enemies. In Deuteronomy, just one chapter before that law I read to you about letting foreigners glean in your field, Deuteronomy states that no Moabite shall be admitted into the assembly of Israel, even down to the 10th generation of descent. And then Deuteronomy 23, verse 6, even goes so far as to say, you shall never promote their welfare or their prosperity as long as you live. And this is enshrined in the law of Israel. So in other words, Moabites like Ruth are the exception to all of the rules of hospitality. Now when Boaz, the owner of the field, asks who this woman is, the first thing that his servant tells him is, she is the Moabite, not she's Ruth, but she's the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Did you hear it emphasized? It's as if he's saying to Boaz, what are you going to do about it? Our reputation is on the line. Are you going to follow the law and kick her out? But Boaz hears a different name than Moab or Moabite in what his servant says to him. He hears the name of Naomi and a light goes off. That's the widow of his relative Elimelech. I suspect that he may have also taken note of Ruth's determination and her work ethic. The servant says that she has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. Let's continue the story in verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. And by calling her daughter, he highlights what is probably a pretty big age difference between the two of them, which will become even more interesting in the next chapter. But, now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. And if you think about it, the mere fact that he has to order the young men not to bother her means that it probably would have been expected that they would have. I don't think this is necessarily a gender thing, although it could be. I think this is an ethnic thing. I think that the young men would have harassed her specifically because they knew that she was a Moabite. They would have considered it their nationalistic obligation. If you get thirsty, continues Boaz, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother 
and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. And here, I think we learn the, at least the initial reason for Boaz's interest in Ruth. He has learned about all that Ruth has done and her connection with her mother-in-law, Naomi, Boaz's relative. He's making sure that Naomi, his relative, is taken care of. And that's something quite noble, but it's also something that would have been completely expected for an Israelite of his stature. You take care of your own people. You have an obligation to do that. And as for taking care of someone who is not your own people, he says, may the Lord repay you. May God take care of you. I'm taking care of Naomi. At least that's one way to interpret the story. And I've always wondered how he might have acted if Ruth the Moabite were just Ruth the Moabite, not Ruth the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Would he still have welcomed her into his field? Or would he have followed the law of his land, which clearly said you shall never promote their welfare or their prosperity as long as you live? Now, it's worth a little detour here to ask the question, why were things so bad between the people of Israel and the people of Moab? By the time the book of Ruth is written, they have been fighting each other for centuries. And like many long-running feuds, chances are the people involved in it have long since forgotten why they started fighting in the first place. But there is a hint of a backstory in that verse that I read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 23 just a little while ago, here's that verse in its fuller context. No Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on your journey out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Now that may sound a little bit petty to us. The Moabites didn't offer food and water to the Israelites a long, long time ago. But you have to understand that in the ancient Middle East, hospitality was a big deal. That's because hotels didn't exist, and all travelers, and everyone would be a traveler at some point. But all travelers had to rely on the kindness, the generosity, the hospitality of local people in whose lands they were traveling through. This is not just an Israel thing. This is pretty much all ancient cultures. If you read their literature and study their laws, they have strong, strong emphasis on the obligation to welcome in the traveler to welcome in the stranger and take care of them because someday you would be the traveler and you would want them to do the same. So when the Israelites were themselves foreigners wandering through the wilderness after escaping from Egypt and slavery, they wandered into the land of Moab. And instead of offering them food and water, the bare minimum standard for assistance, the people of Moab shunned them. Not only did they shun them, they hired a professional prophet to curse them. And in time, that little slight grew into full-fledged hostility between the two peoples. Now, Boaz, at this point, has fulfilled his obligation to his relative Naomi, by allowing Ruth to glean in the field, knowing that Ruth is going to take that back to Naomi, she is taken care of, and he has said, may the Lord reward you, and he is rewarding Naomi. Boaz owes nothing to Ruth, and he might very well have said, your ancestors did not offer food and water to my people when we were in need, so why should I do anything for you? now that you are in need. Of 
course, Boaz does the opposite. Verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls from, for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. How do you break a generational curse? How do you undo and walk back centuries of violence and warfare? Forget about negotiated treaties and peace accords. Change begins with simple person-to-person -person acts of kindness and generosity and hospitality. Looking past the way you or your ancestors were slighted, letting go of insults, letting go of wrongs and harms, and turning the page, and starting a new chapter fresh. Peace begins when we offer food, drink, and shelter to refugees, to strangers, to travelers, to those in need. The criteria for this aid is not whether it's deserved, it's not whether it's earned, it's simply whether it's needed. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. What's an ephah of barley? It's about eight pounds worth of grain. Or for those who are curious and interested in such things, it's about enough grain to make 42 loaves of bread or 490 bottles of beer. Verse 18, she picked it up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, that man is a relative of ours one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. That's the end of chapter two, and if the story has kept your interest up to this point, know that the story really heats up in chapter three, which we'll read next week. But before we end today, I want to quickly highlight three principles that I think we can glean, pun intended, from chapter two of Ruth's story. I've already talked at length about the first principle, which is hospitality. You see, when the other workers in the field saw that Moabite foreigner in their midst, few of them could have imagined that she would someday be, along with Boaz, the owner of the field in which they were working. Be careful what you say about people. Fewer still could have imagined that this foreign woman that they were looking at would someday be the great-grandmother of David, Israel's greatest king. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament puts it this way, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels unaware. 
I think it would be good for all of us to imagine that every stranger that we meet, every refugee, every traveler who has need or who asks us for help might someday turn out to be very, very important to us or to our children or to our world. And so we should extend our hospitality accordingly. The second principle we glean from Ruth chapter 2 is about initiative. When Ruth arrives in Israel, she doesn't passively wait for someone to rescue her, to feed her, or to show kindness to her. No. She takes matters into her own hands. She tells her mother-in-law, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain. Let me solve our problem or at least work towards that. And then she works hard throughout the day. Likewise, Boaz, when he sees a Moabite woman gleaning in his field, doesn't say, well, that's interesting. Instead, he takes initiative. Who is she? What's her story? How can I help her? And then he springs into action. God is indeed present throughout the book of Ruth, guiding and directing all of these random encounters. But the central characters of the story do their part. They work hard. They ask the right questions. They defy conventions. And they take responsibility for their lives and their circumstances. The next time you are waiting for God to bless you or to rescue you or help you win the lottery, you might also ask yourself, what's my part in the story? What's my role? What is mine to do here? I believe that God blesses our initiative, God blesses our hard work, and multiplies it beyond our capability. When you take that initiative and you put it together with the hospitality, the initiative on the part of those who have need and the hospitality on the part of those who are able, and you put those together, you have the third and final principle, the most important one that we glean from our story today, and that is community. Naomi leans on Ruth when she has no one else to lean on. Ruth leans on Naomi when she enters with her into a new land with unfamiliar conventions and customs. Boaz comes into this community honoring his family ties, but then making new family ties in the process. Without any one of these three characters, the hopes and dreams of the other two would never be realized. Hospitality opens the door to new relationships and new opportunities. Initiative walks through the door, seizing those opportunities and bringing those new relationships into fruition. But then community nurtures and sustains them both, cementing us in our new life, in our new relationships, allowing us to put down deep roots and to thrive. I hope you have that kind of community in your life. And if you don't, I hope that we as a church can be that kind of community for you. It's certainly what church is all about. We were designed by our Creator to live in community, in fellowship with other people. Our entire bodies are designed to do that. The reason that that we read each other's facial expressions so well is because we've been doing it for millions of years and that's what we were made to do. I realize that we are now coming out of a season where that was really challenging to do, to be present for one another, to love one another, to care for one another and serve one another in person in a meaningful way. But if there's anything we can make out of all of that, my hope is that we can Let that be cause for us not to take for granted as we begin to reemerge, as we begin to meet with each other, as we begin to go into one another's homes, as we begin to shake hands and hug necks again when that time comes. Let's not take those things for granted. Let's not neglect to meet, to gather together, because it's who God calls us to be for each other and for the world. Let us pray. 
Lord, you have given us many gifts, many abilities. When we are in need, you have given us initiative, the ability to stand up and do what we need to do. When we have more than what we need, you have shown us the example of hospitality, how to help those others around us, our neighbors, people who are in need. And when these two things come together, Lord, cement us in wholesome, holy community so that we may continue to help each other, continue to love each other and serve each other all the days of our life. We pray all these things just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. 